What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in this box? What's in the box? Hello once again Monster Hobbies Model Car Garage Mechanics and welcome back to another great show. So I got a question to ask you, what was your first car? My first car was a 1972 Toyota Corolla SR5. That's what it was known over here in Canada as. And I'm really happy that I actually found a model kit of it. Now I found this model kit a long time ago but I've never been able to get it from any other hobby shop in Canada. Because, you know, the, I'd go and ask and the hobby shop owners would be like, Oh, well, you know, we can't get that. That's from Japan, blah, 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 and some other stuff. So I never got it. And finally, my wholesaler started to bring these in. So this is the Fujimi kit. This is a 1972 Toyota 11 T, what is it, TE27. Now this is what the car was known as in Japan. But over here, of course, it was the Toyota Corolla SR5. Now, my first car I actually got from somebody that I knew, and they were a mechanic. And the thing is, whatever they didn't understand, they just pulled off and uh, replaced with bailing wire and whatnot. So the car was actually, the automatic choke was removed and it was replaced with some wire holding the choke together. So uh, the other thing was it had a front end collision and the guy straightened it out kind of and he put hood pins in here and here and one hood pin was like an inch and a half away from the edge and the other was like a sixteenth of an inch away from the edge. So my dad and I, this was before I even took auto body collision repair, we tried to straighten the car out in the front and uh, we got it all back together pretty well. We found a, a proper automatic choke from the junkyard and put it on. We got the car running pretty good. Had the five-speed stick because it was the SR5 so it was a specialty model and that thing could hill climb. The engine was the 2TC I believe. It's been a long time ago. This is back in the early 90s. So but it was a hemispherical head, a four-cylinder Hemi. Really cool car. So anyway, without further ado, uh, let's pop open this model and see how it compares to my own car. Oh, and speaking of my car, this is what it looked like once we got it finished. Here we have the front of the box and this is our Toyota 11 TE27 for 72. And you can see that this is a wonderful dark green paint job on this car. One thing mine did not have were these fender flares neither did it have these cool rims on here and our mirrors were up here being of course a Canadian North American type of car and we had left hand drive and this kit is a right hand drive even though on the box it shows left hand which is quite deceiving actually I was hoping it was left hand because trying to convert the dashboard over it isn't too difficult but it is another job you have to do on this edge of the box we can see a wonderful orange colored Toyota Mine was red originally and uh, there was some yellow, like the hood was yellow and everything because this was basically a parts car when I got it. But overall it does look nice in that orange as we slide the box across. You can see again the dark green and then here's one in sort of a gloss or a flat black. On this side of the box we can see some color callouts as well as some information, warning sort of things and info on the car. However, this is all written in Japanese, so I don't really know what it is saying. Opening up the lid, we can see we've got our instructions right off the top. Again, really nice work. You can see the illustrated drawing. This is a drafting kind of thing, where you see the front and the rear, the top and the side. Again, really cool stuff. Inside, you can see how nicely the Japanese package everything. Everything comes in a bag. This is really great, especially with the glass, so that none of the parts get lost or scratched. There we have a bunch of the components. We also have our decal sheet here. And then we've got our interior parts tree and all that. 
rubber tires. These ones are actually quite squishy, which I like. And then we've got our rims here and uh, chrome bumpers, the parts tray with the steering wheel, and then the body is molded in white. So let's take a look at these plastic parts, but first we'll take a look at the instructions. Here we have our instruction sheet for our 72 Toyota 11 TE27. Here you get the nice three quarter view of the actual car from the box art. And then, we, uh, like I was saying before, you get this schematical drawing of the front of the car, the rear of the car, the top of the car, and the side of the car. Now one thing I did on my car was that I made up some really cool stripes in here. And I sort of did a half curve like this in the sunken in area of the hood. Another half curve there. I painted that flat black inside and that gave me those really cool racing stripes. So this is what we have on the side view of our car and it does say to apply decals on the body as you like. The Fujimi instructions are really nice because here they give you all the symbols that you're going to see as you build your model and they also show you this entire parts count which is showing you the parts trees from the top down so that you can tell if something is missing, what it would be, and what parts you're going to see in your kit. Step one is the assembly of our wheels. So here it shows how to paint them following the paint chart that's also on the instruction sheet. And then you've got your little front rubber squishy right there. And this is a wheel retainer. And then that goes into the wheel itself and the wheel goes into the tire. You don't need any glue here, so that makes it nice and easy. You make four of these wheels. Now we get into our front suspension. One thing that I always found cool about this car is that it had the modern style Ford IFS suspension up front, and then the back was basically 57 Chevy with leaf springs. My dad always said that the Japanese copied the American cars, and Datsun specifically <laughs> copied the uh, British Jaguar type of car. So here we have our McPherson struts here, as well as the front disc brakes, and we have a pin going through, and that gets into your wheels. Again, don't use any glue so that your wheels are free rolling. And then down here in panel three, we see the suspension going onto the chassis. Now here it tells you to paint your transmission with aluminum, also aluminum for the engine block as far as I remember. Now I did have this car 30 years ago, so it is hard to remember every little detail on it. Here we have our rack and pinion style steering, and that's our connecting rods there. And then that entire uh, front suspension drops right down here on the engine and holds everything in place. Nice and simple if you've got a kid that wants to build this model, makes it really, really easy for them. Panel four here shows our suspension in the back going together. And like I said, here's the leaf springs, as well as this nice plastic axle we have in here. And then the drive shaft and differential drop in over place just to hold that all together. Remember to paint your exhaust system here with aluminum again, just to make it all nice and look good underneath. Now these cars were unibody, so again, there might've been some paint over spray on the chassis here, but primarily, if I recall right, the chassis is either body color or black. I don't remember right then. <laughs> but my dad in his garage, he had one of the old pits. You know, it was basically a concrete hole in the floor and you remove wooden, beams across the top that was basically a floorboard and then you walk underneath in the pit and you can look up from underneath and see what's going on with your car over here we have seat belts this is for the interior this is pretty cool you get this nice material and you cut them to length it tells you how long to cut them how wide to cut them and where to put the tapers in Panel five shows our dashboard going together and here it shows all the decals which go in to make the faces of the gauges. And it also shows our steering column and our steering wheel going on. Now one thing, if you wanted to make this right hand drive, you'd have to cut out the instrument panels here and the dashboard over here and reverse them. And what I would suggest is actually just cutting the, these out keeping them to the side and then making new ones out of sheet styrene because 
you have that angle in here and that angle in here and just to switch them your angle would be in here and here so that wouldn't work out very nicely so basically just replace them with flat sheets of plastic with the appropriate holes and pins stuck in them to make it look like that dashboard with the vents and everything that were on it. Now going down here into panel 6, we see the interior going together with the tops of the bucket seats dropping down in place. There is the optional roll bar in here, as well as all our racing seat belts which were up above here, and the dashboard going in, as well as the parking brake down here. Panel 7 shows our engine pan being put together. Basically it's just a nice paint job. The radiator, radiator hose and the engine and this little air vent and everything are all included in the one piece stamping. Unfortunately you don't get a full out engine like you do in maybe an AMT model kit or a Ravel kit or a monogram where it's got the two piece engine block, the transmission, as well as the cylinder heads and all that. All of this is just one piece. Another thing that's interesting about this is that the hood doesn't open, so you're going to have to cut the hood open in order to display this. And here we have our completed interior tub going down on that chassis. So again, it makes it all nice and simple. So if you're just starting out, you do get some detail and a wonderful kit that's easy to put together. Panel 8 is where we start getting into the body. So here we have our glass going down into the body itself as well as our rear view mirror going into that hole. And here it shows you how to paint up your rear tail lamps. Here I'm just tilting panel nine over so you can see what's going on. So here's the body from step eight and the undercarriage assembly from step seven. So what you're doing is you're aiming for the front here. There's a couple little grooves and there's a little flat piece up on the front of that chassis pan. And you just slot the grooves into there. And then you swing the back end down and you kind of pry it open just a little bit until these tabs lock into place in these holes. Panel 10 shows our rear end being put together. So what we have over here to start with is the paint coloring for our tail lights, both right and left. And here we have the amber going down. That was for the turn signal. And then we have red here as our brake lights. I do believe this one was basically dead, just a red reflector. And then here we have the white backup lens. So getting over here, we have some paint going in here. That was chrome. And then we've got these mud flaps which go back here. And then we have our rear bumper being glued in place, the tail lamps going in there, and our license plate. Panel 11 shows the front end of the car going together. To start with, we have our grill. Now these grills were all painted aluminum, and uh, they we got our headlights going in. We also have the Toyota Crest right here for the Corolla, or the Levin as they called it in Japan. There we have our front turn signals going in. Here we've got some fog lamps. That's if you want to build this sort of as a rally car. We also have a splash apron down here. There's our front bumper and our license plate. We also have these aerodynamic bits right in the front, which act as ground effects. Now here we have those racing mirrors. Those went on the front of the fenders in Japan, but you could fill these holes and move them into the side of the door for the North American style. We also have our door handles here, and we've got these wonderfully molded separate windshield wiper blades which drop into those two holes. Here, these little scoops were actually vents for fresh air, and I took mine out. They had like plastic insert in there, and then it was metal on the back. And I took mine out and I painted those uh, bright chrome color. So that's the assembly of our model in 11 easy steps. So again, a nice little kit that you could build over the weekend. Now let's take a look at all the plastic components. So let's start off with the body of our model kit. And here you can see it is one solid casting. The hood is molded in place, so that basically means that it's a curbside model. Unless you want to take your knife and just scribe this hood out cut it open so that you can see that engine underneath. Now this really reminds me of my car except for those wheel flares, I never had them. But again you can see just how nice this is, really smooth casting. There's really no seam lines coming up here, maybe a little bit on the roof, you can barely even see them. So just a nice little rub down with some sandpaper would really get rid of them. And there we have our gas filler cap, these nice little vents off the side, they're pretty cool actually. This was a really nice car back in the day. 
There's that front end. These always remind me of hockey for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. But there, you can see a little bit of seam line down here. There's a little bit of flash, just barely. Like I can barely even feel it. There is a mold mark, actually a seam line going un underneath the hood here. But overall, I mean, this is really smooth. There's no like sink marks anywhere on this body, which unfortunately there are a lot on the American models. Again, here's our rear tail lamps. So one thing I actually, on the real car, my real Toyota back in the day, I painted in here with the Timea uh, metallic blue color. I forget what the number is, but that's the way I did mine. There's our little exhaust pipe right there, and there is a little bit of a parts tree cutoff just right there. But overall, I mean, this is a wonderful model and really brings back a nostalgic feeling for me, having owned one of these. And again, like I said, what was your first car and have you found it in a model kit form? And do you also get that nostalgic feel like, hey, I finally found something that really belongs to me? Here we have our first of the black parts tree sprues. One thing that's always nice with the Japanese is that they actually put a letter right here saying which part tree is the first. I wish the uh, North American manufacturers would do that as well. It helps if you're uh, like missing a parts tree or whatever. So here we have our undercarriage or our chassis and there's our engine with the transmission there. And we also have our exhaust pipe coming down here. And this is our spare tire cover. Or was that the, no, that was a gas tank, I do believe. Like I say, it's been 30 plus years since I actually owned this car. So I can't remember really where everything was. There's our rack and pinion steering, McPherson struts, as well as our disc brakes. There's our rear view mirror. And here we have our rear axle and differential as well as the front suspension here, and there's our engine. Now, I remember my engine being quite different in appearance than this, the way they've uh, represented it here. So I don't know if this was a special TE27 type of engine, but uh, mine ended up being, I think, 1600 cc, which was 92 cubic inch, if I remember this all right. I was pretty proud of it back in the day. Here it has a Toyota stamped up on this component here. And like I said, mine was different. Mine had a different type of head on here. It was still hemispherical, but I do remember the oil filler cap being somewhere on that head. I could be wrong. I, I just don't quite remember it. And I don't have it, the car anymore to pop the hood and show everybody what it was like. But overall, again, look at that nice crisp detailing. Now, like I said, you could build this quite quickly. There's the unibody there with the rail across by the door sill. And you can see the subframes here, front and in the rear. It's got the rear leaf springs on there. Again, really cool. Uh, one thing that was kind of funny back in the day, here's a humorous story for everyone. So, like I was saying before, my dad had a pit in the garage, and we used to be able to drive a car over the pit You'd remove the uh, boards of the pit first and drive a car over, then climb underneath it and take a look at what was going on. So my sister got this 1972 Ford Comet, a Mercury Comet, from one of the uh, people we knew. <laughs> and uh, the guy, re the exhaust leaked along here. <laughs> and the guy's idea of repairing it was to take band-aids and put all the band-aids over the holes. So when we climbed underneath there, we saw this exhaust pipe with band-aids all over it and we cracked up, man. It was the funniest thing we ever saw. Do you have a story like that? What's the weirdest mechanical thing you've ever seen underneath a car? Uh, hopefully nothing dangerous, but you know, just relatively bizarre. If you have such a story, let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear that. Here we have parts tree B, and this one includes our interior tub as well as our rear axle, these front little pins, which I thought were metal, but they turn out to be plastic, but that's okay. Here we have our rack and pinion steering as well. There's our dashboard and our front grille. These are the actual stock rims that I had. All I gotta do is paint them silver to match mine, but I do believe on the original car these were black. There's our rally racing wheel, as well as the bucket seats in the back. 
or the upper part of our bucket seats. These are license plates. We also have our gear shift lever, parking brake, steering console, and those are the windshield wipers. And then we've got the front spoiler ground effects sort of thing going on, as well as our mud flaps for the rear. We have the roll bar here and our fog lights and the front chin spoiler. So I'm just gonna move these out of the way. We'll bring this up to the camera. Now I did have this center console in my car. Now what happened is in my car, the floor was all rusty and this side window was busted. And I really remember vacuuming this thing out, getting rid of all the glass and then drive the car around and then more glass would pop up out of the nooks and crannies of the floorboard because they didn't have a carpet in there. And that just kept going on for months. I don't think I ever got the glass out of it before I got rid of the car. There is a little bit of a blob of something on the seat right here. I'll have to try to remove that somehow. Now here it's got open holes. That's where the wheel arches are gonna fit in. There's the back seat as well as the bottoms of the bucket seats. Now, I knew a friend that had, um, he worked in the carpet. He actually installed carpets. So to replace my carpets, I actually got some offcuts from him in a light tan color and we put those in. And the door panels, they, they're actually not existent on this kit, but on mine, the uh, previous owner put in these speakers and then he removed the speakers so there's a big giant hole in there. So my dad and I, we cut the bottom of the door panel off and replaced it with a fake leatherette. And that was a dark brown and that complemented that tan carpet we put in. But overall, those are my memories of the car. What about your car, first car? Did you have to redo any upholstery or anything in it? Let us know in the comments down below. So again, the uh, detail on here is quite nice, but rather, well, simplistic on these parts. But as you look at the dashboard again, you can see just how nice it is. Now I know this is black plastic, so it may not be reading too well on the camera. But like I said, if you're very careful, you can get rid of this panel and this panel and just redo them in a sheet of plastic and reverse them if you wanted the right hand drive. I think I'm going to leave mine alone. I'm just going to pretend that I was in Japan at the time. <laughs> There's that front grill, and boy, I remember this well. I had to remove it and put it back on a few times, painted it up. It was uh, it was actually hollow in the back, so you could easily just dry brush over top of that and uh, bring out all these little dots on here. And of course, the nice Corolla emblem. There's those stock rims, and they are open. If you can take a look at this somehow, let's see. You can, yeah, right there. You can see that the slots are open in this. So it's a really nice detailed piece. And again, the front backs of the buckets look much like what I had from memory. I don't remember having a rally wheel. Maybe I did. I, I can't remember. I'd have to try to dig up some old photographs of this, uh, my real car. But they're buried in my house, so that's not going to happen in this video. There's the wheels. You can see how deep they are in here. Again, really neat stuff. Now there are some mold or yeah, mold marks on the back here, but I don't think it's really going to make a difference. There are pins on the floor and that goes into the upholstery in the back. And there are some mold marks in the backs of the back of the seats and there isn't like a flat cover in here to cover them over. So I can't remember if that's the way they were on the real car. If you owned one, let me know in the comments below. I guess I can always do a Google search and uh, find pictures of it but that's the way I remember my car being and uh, hopefully you remember if you had one of these that it was much the same here's our next parts tree and it is parts tree R maybe that stands for racing I don't know now it looks a little bit weird because I still have it in the plastic bag and the reason why is I wanted to show you this is what Fujimi does they don't seal across the bags like uh, like the American model kits do or whatever they actually just fold the bag over and staple it. And that means that you could reuse this bag for your parts. So I'll just take this out of the bag and take a look at this. This is all the seatbelt detail. These are all the little clips and harnesses to pass your seatbelt through and to lock it into the floor and everything of your model. So again, that looks really cool. And oh, maybe, you know, Maybe the reason why there's no uh, detail on those door panels is because they're actually removed for rally racing. That's a thought. 
And here we have our rally type steering wheel, which is sort of thinner than that stock one that we just took a look at. But again, overall, this is really a nice little parts tree right here. And you could always end up using these little harness clips on some other project if you don't want to use them on this model. Here we have our clear parts tree. And as you can see, there are no actual you know, red tinted taillights or amber colored ones, but you can use the Tamiya clear or even the Model Master stoplight and turn signal ambers and reds and paint them in here and make this look really nice. There are some raised sections here to add in a little bit of silver paint. And here we have our front headlights as well as our glass. Now the one thing that's nice about this is all the windows are rolled up so you won't get any dust in your interior but it does make it a little more difficult to see through. Again the headlights have the nice check pattern in here. Remember to put those in north and south and east and west so that you don't have a headlight at a weird angle in there. Pay close attention to that. And there we have our front turn signals as well which you would paint in amber. There is a little hole right here for the rear view mirror and there are four little mold marks, but they're up at the top in the roof and you won't really see them in your completed model. Here we have two parts trees, which I'll show together basically because they're so small. And what we have is the front and rear bumper right here. And this one is more of an aluminum parts tree. It's not quite got the brilliance of the chrome up above it, but these are the racing wheels. And boy, this would have been a cool set to have back in the day. The closest I got to cool wheels like this were a set of American-made slot mag wheels for uh, Toyota, which I think they had four slots in them because they were four bolt wheel pattern. But boy, I would have loved to have these back in the day. So uh, let's take a look at the bumpers. Basically, they're really reminiscent of what I had, just a flat bent over bumper that attached both front and rear. So the back is more square like this and the front is the curved one. So again, very simplistic. One and two. <laughs> what more do you need? Okay, let's take a look at these really cool wheels. Look at that nice detailing in here. These are wide open with little basically fins or bars or whatever just holding that rim on there. Again, really cool looking. Boy, I wish I had these. <laughs> What kind of uh, mag wheels or whatever would you have put on your first car if you had the choice? Let us know down in the comments below. Maybe uh, Krager 5 stars or the slot style or maybe something different. I remember at one time there was ones that had like little cats in them or something bizarre. <laughs> but anyway, that is our chrome parts tree and it gives you your choice of either using that stock wheel factory wheel or these nice racing ones. So what would you use? Let us know in the comments down below. Here we have the tires for the model kit. Now these are Pirelli's. I could make out the logo but I couldn't make out the tire size on here. So if you've got a magnifying glass you can uh, really take a look at these and let me know in the comments down below. These are actual rubber because when you open the bag you can smell that rubber smell. And here we have neoprene wheel retainers. Now the way these work is of course you cut them off. And here I've got my wheels for reference. So you see that collar down there. You would push one of these down into the collar. And then when you press your wheel onto your axle, the axle pin pushes into the neoprene holes and expands it and that pushes up against the collar here which locks your wheel into place. So these are only meant to go on once so make sure you have your wheels all together and everything ready to go. And here we've got our tire which we can just drop onto that rim. And uh, it's a little bit rough but that's what it would look like when it's complete. So I'll just put that to the side. Take a look at that nice tread pattern you got in there. Really cool stuff. There is a seam line though that runs up the center. So if you put this in your wheel spinning tool and use a bit of sandpaper, you can just sand that all down and make it look nice and worn, just like it had run on the real road. So again, really cool tires here with that nice neoprene locking device. And again, highly recommended. Here's our decal sheets for our Toyota, and Fujimi was actually quite cool here by giving us all these sponsor decals. And you could use them on the car, or you could use them in other places, like these Pepsi logos. 
Now, how many of you have got any of the AMT Coca-Cola model kits and they come with a vending machine and here's like the front door of that vending machine. You could actually turn this into a Pepsi vending machine just by using these decals on here and getting rid of the Coca-Cola ones. Or you could also use this. This is a cider company, I guess, in Japan. So you could put this decal on the sides or something like that and have it as the cider company. Now down here we've got our license plates. These are Japanese ones. I'm probably not going to use them. I'll print up my own British Columbia ones that I had back in the day. But here you get the Leven script as well as the Toyota one here. And there's your gauges for on your dashboard as well as these other little decals here which are symbols and whatever. There's a number 11 up here. I, I do believe some of these things are recommended in Japan. Like I've seen this on windshields on some of the kits. I don't know if it's like a registry sticker or something they used back in the day in Japan. Uh, totally foreign to me, being of course in British Columbia, Canada. But I do love all these sponsors that they got on here. Again, Bliston Shocks and Mate Racing. Sab Sabit, I think, or Sabilet or something. Um, I got to get new glasses, guys. <laughs> so I'm having a little trouble here. GT2, I do believe this is tires, BS tires. <laughs> BS tires. Um, Mitsua Cider, so that you could also use on that vending machine. And of course, STP and Shell, these are look good in a gas station somewhere. So again, really excellent stuff and a wonderful, colorful, bright decal sheet. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video where we got to unbox this amazing Fujimi 1972 Toyota TE2711. I'm loving it. So in the comments below, let me know what your first car was and some of the stories and have you found it as a model kit? Oh, and if you are looking for this model kit, I also have one for sale at www.monster-hobbies.ca, which you can get now for a very good price. I'll actually leave the link for this model swinging across here. And if that doesn't work, because some of my YouTube channels I can't do that on, uh, again, check it out, www.monster-hobbies.ca. I'll leave the link in the description below. So hope you enjoyed that video. And until next time, everyone, happy model building. And I hope you find your first car as a model.